Okay, going to continue here with the Galatians expository study. This week we're going to be in Galatians chapter 4. So you can turn in your King James Bible to Galatians chapter 4. And we're going to go through it verse by verse. If you are new to uh, being saved and things, when you t hear expository study, it means going through and, and basically discussing each verse. So Galatians chapter 4. And I have every, all the scriptures typed out here, so I'm just going to be reading from here, just as a way to save some time. But uh, we have here Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Now, it said there in verse 1, the heir. Who's the heir? Well, if you remember from last week, Galatians chapter 3.29 says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Then it goes into chapter 4, and it says, The heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So, the fact is, right now, we are children in God's sight. God does not look at us as, you know, being really grown up. Even those that are saved, and you know, you could have a man that's saved and been in ministry for 50 years, God still looks at him as a child. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to show you this thing here. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is all about charity in your King James Bible. And charity is the right word. Don't ever let anybody tell you that the word should be better translated as love. All right. You can look at a lot of uh, things about love, and uh, a lot of it does not mean true self sacrifice self-sacrificial uh, charity, which is the right word in the King James Bible. Uh, love in, a, in our day and age today can mean a lot of very perverted and twisted things. Charity is the right word. It means self-sacrificing, giving of yourself, charity. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 13, we're going to read these verses here. It says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether there be tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, do you remember when you were little and people would say to you, you'll understand when you're older? Yeah. You know, there's a lot about the Bible, a lot about the Lord that you're not going to understand here on this earth. God is not going to give you 100% perfect knowledge. That's why there in verse 12 it says, we now, now we see through a glass darkly. Okay, we aren't going to understand everything. You're not looking at a man who can preach this book perfectly. And you never will find a man that can preach the book perfectly. That's why you have to have some grace. You know, there are, there are brethren out there that disagree with me on a couple issues, but they still respect the fact that they know my heart. They know I'm trying to serve the Lord. They know I'm trying to preach the Bible correctly. And so they hear something they disagree with. As long as it's not a major doctrine, they'll keep watching the videos. That's fine. I do that with some of my brethren. I don't agree with everybody. You know, I don't agree with any man 100% of the time. I agree with the book 100% of the time. But I know that God's never going to allow any man on this earth to teach this King James Bible 100% perfectly. Not going to happen. Why? We're children. We are children in comparison to the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice there in verse 12 it says, Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Face to face with who? You know, a lot of people try to exposit this and they say that these verses of Scripture here in 1 Corinthians are dealing with now, you know, back in the first century, they didn't have the Bible completed, but then when it's completed, how does that work out with face to face? No, it's talking about now we see through a glass darkly as children, but when we, when we become a man... When we actually go to see Jesus Christ and we see him face to face, see, then we're going to know. But 
continue reading here in verse 12. For now, for I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. You will know how Jesus Christ knows you. Okay? You will know even as also I am known. See, that's what's going on there. You will have the mind of Christ when you go up at the rapture. That's when it's going to happen. That's when you will have that perfect knowledge. You say, well, how do you know? Well, because we're going to be coming back with him to rule and reign on the earth if you suffer, you know, right now in this life, if you suffer for Jesus Christ, if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, then you will rule and reign with Jesus Christ. But the point is, you are going to have to have the mind of Christ to come back down here and rule and reign with him. We can't have all the different denominations, you know, fighting and warring with one another throughout the millennial kingdom. All right? Not going to work. So we're going to have to have the mind of Christ. Okay? So, the fact is, you know, Galatians chapter 4, there talked about the thing of being a child right now. You know? And that's always going to be the way it is. That's why you need to have charity for people that are in ministry. You need to have some charity for your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, don't think that you're ever going to be perfect while you're here on this life. Not going to happen. You will be when you go to meet with Jesus Christ, though. But let's continue. Go back to Galatians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Okay, it says here, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Hmm. That's interesting. Jesus was made under the law? I thought, wait, he was born in the New Testament. No, Jesus was born in a collection of books called the New Testament. But Jesus was doctrinally born in the Old Testament. That's why they had a sacrifice. Two young turtle doves. You know, they had to sacrifice. Interesting. You say, well, when did the New Testament come in? Hebrews chapter 9. You can go there in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 through 17 tells you when the New Testament started. It did not start in Matthew chapter 1. Okay, this is called heresy by a lot of people out there. They say dispensational teaching is heresy. No, as with many things, it is Bible doctrine. Okay, let's read here. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 through 17. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is, of, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Jesus' death on the cross is what brought in the New Testament. So when you read things, most of the book of Matthew... Up until chapter, what, 28, I guess it is. Up until then, you're dealing with doctrine for the Old Testament. You're dealing with scriptures that are being written to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel. That's why when you have Christians today trying to use Matthew chapter 24 to teach doctrine for the body of Christ, they get things all messed up. I mean, read through Matthew chapter 24. Let them which be in Judea pray that your flight be not on this Sabbath day in the winter neither on the sabbath day excuse me what are christians doing in judea what are christians doing keeping the sabbath day when nowhere in the pauline epistles are you told to keep the sabbath day and the sabbath day is a sign between god and the nation of israel huh see there's a bunch of problems there when you don't rightly divide the word of truth as you're commanded to in second timothy chapter 2 verse 15 very important. But let's get back here to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 verse 5. Okay, it says here, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of, adoption of sons. Okay, now, it's important here to understand this. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. You say, uh, but I thought the Jews were saved automatically because they're God's chosen people. No, they were under the law, but they were not redeemed. That's why Jesus Christ had to come. 
That's why he had to die on the cross. Important to get that. Let's continue. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now, you know, you can read that, but you can't really fully grasp it. No, none of us really can. Why? This stuff is all still unseen. I mean, it's still faith right now that we live under. We still live by faith. We still have to believe that God is real and that there is a place called heaven and whatever else. We're going to go there to be with Him and all that stuff. But, you know, think about what we just read there. I know we can't fully comprehend it, but think about this. That we are sons and heirs of God through Christ. In other words, you know, if I invite you over here, you're pretty much going to be a stranger to me. You're not going to be part of my blood family, we'll say. You know, it might feel a little bit weird if you if I'd invite you to one of my family get-togethers or something like that. You might be kind of like, oh, this kind of feels weird. Why? You're not a blood relative. But think about going to heaven. And you get up there and you're looking around and you're going, am I supposed to be here? You know, look at all these saints, look at these martyrs, look at the angels, look at all this other stuff. Wow, and there's God up on the throne. And the Lord's like, yeah, you're one of my children. You're a son. Wow, <laughs> that's really something. You see, you might have a very lowly position here on the, in the world. And if you're saved, you probably do. And you're probably made fun of by people and probably, probably put down. And you probably don't have the best house and you probably don't have the best vehicle and... <laughs> You know, on down the list. But keep in mind, brother, sister, if you're saved, you are part of the greatest royal family family in the universe. You are a son of God, a child, a joint heir. So when Jesus Christ comes back down here to the earth, if you suffered with him, you're going to rule and reign with him. Wow. So don't let this... The wicked people of this world get you down, and I know they do. They get me down sometimes, you know. You're treated like pond scum or lower than that. Uh, remember that you are part of a royal family. Keep that in mind. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. That's also very interesting. All lost people worship God false gods you say well come on now you know i got neighbors and family and whatever else and they're you know they're lost but you know they i don't they don't have idols and things in their homes well you see we're thinking of idols some goofy little statue some guy with a pot belly sitting there you know with his legs crossed like buddha or you think of some weird whatever else or mary you know whatever you know we think of those as being idols but there are other types of false gods how about mammon Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. What's mammon? Mammon is money. Kind of like a false god of money. How many people refuse to get saved because they understand it's going to cost them money? It's going to cost them their reputation. It's going to cost them possibly their job. They're not going to be able to cheat on things and scam people out of money and things like that. And they realize too, if I'm serving the Lord and I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ, He might not let me have a really high paying career where I'm making lots and lots of money. You know, maybe He'll actually ask me to sacrifice my life so I can serve Him. Oh, oh not that. Oh boy, you know. Yeah. And you see the Bible says, you know, and you get these people and say, well, I can be a multimillionaire Christian. You know, I can be big business and stuff like that and still do the big money thing and stuff like that. You know, and I, you know, I can be a rich Christian. It's not what the Bible says. Hmm. How about idols? Different idols that people have that are actually, you know, idols are actually devils. 
We're going to see this here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You can turn there if you want to. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. You know, and again, I mentioned some of these earlier. You have this little fat Buddha guy, and you have Mary. You know, you see these these things out in people's yards. They're kind of like a looks like a bathtub, half of a bathtub sticking up, and then you got Mary, the statue of Mary, and she's in there. You know, like this. What are what are those things? First Corinthians chapter ten, verse nineteen. What say I then that the idol is anything, or that which is sacrificed to in excuse me, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You know, again, society tries to pressure you into being somewhat politically correct and saying, you know, well, you know, Okay, maybe the Statue of Mary is an idol, but, you know, uh, you know, uh, it's a devil, according to that scripture right there. These idols, these false idols, you know, we're not to have graven images and things. These false idols are devils. And I'll tell you, one of the worst ones is this, this effeminate-looking, long-haired, sissy Jesus guy. Okay, that guy, show me a description of Jesus you know, looking like this guy in the King James Bible. Show me it. Show me it. I don't see it anywhere. So who is this guy in the paintings? That, that Most of the paintings come from Roman Catholics. Could it be that they've been painting the Antichrist for thousands of years? Getting people prepared for the day that he would eventually show up? You know, Isaiah chapter 53 says that there is no beauty, that we should desire him. Jesus was not an attractive man. I know that's really hard for a lot of people to believe that have seen all these stupid Hollywood productions and stuff of this Jesus, you know. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus was not an attractive man, physically attractive. So who is this guy that's in these paintings? Something to think about there. What is he? I think he's a devil. I think he's going to be the ultimate devil, the Antichrist. Look out for that. Acts chapter 17, you can go there in your Bible. We're going to read a couple verses here, Acts chapter 17. And again, remember there what it said in Galatians 4 verse 8, as you're turning to Acts 17, it said, Howbeit then when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. All right, Acts chapter 17 verse 26 through 20, or excuse me, Acts chapter 17 verse 16 it says here, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers, look out for that, of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others, other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection." So these people were pagan, and they were basically thinking that Paul was just preaching another false god. But we'll see here what Paul says. Verse 19, And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Let me just pause there for a minute. You know, it's interesting, these pagan people, these philosophers and these great academia, you know, scholarly types and stuff, what did they spend their time in? Either to tell or to hear some new thing. New, 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 new. How do you know America and the UK and most other countries, how do you know that they're becoming pagan? Because the people spend all their time looking for new things. People go to shopping malls and camp outside for a day or two so they can be first in line to buy the newest piece of junk that comes from China. Hmm. New video game, new iPhone, new whatever. They spend their time in nothing else but to hear or tell some new thing. Hmm. 
Bible's archaic, you know, the King James Bible's just not up to date, you know. Right. Verse 22. What did Paul say about this? Then Paul stood up, or then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Not very religious like a lot of the new perversions say. Verse 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth in Baptist temples. Oh, excuse me, I didn't read that right. It says, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to, light, to all life and breath and all things. So Paul is basically saying to these people, he realized they were ignorant. He realized that these people have never heard about Jesus Christ. And so he came to them and he said, you don't know who this, you know, you say this altar here, it says to the unknown God. You don't know who God is, but I'm going to declare him unto you. You know, see at that point from then on, now they were accountable. Now they had heard the truth. All right. But it's interesting because, you know, these people were worshiping all these pagan deities and, and false gods and everything else. And the ironic part about that is you have people that say, oh, I refuse to worship God, you know, whatever. But you're worshiping his creation. You say, oh, no, I'm worshiping uh, Lucifer or something like that. Yeah, Lucifer is subservient to God. You know, I mean, you're going to worship something in this world. Why not worship the one who made everything? You know, if you worship money, well, who made money? God. You worship the devil who made the devil. God, you worship Mary, which, you know, the Mary of Catholicism is not the Mary of the Bible. But, uh, you know, who made Mary or Semiramis, if you want to go with the actual Catholic name there, the real goddess of Catholicism, who made her? God. And I'm not saying, you know, if you worship something else that you get saved. No, there's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved. That's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. But the point is, Everything that's worshipped is created by God. So it seems kind of stupid to worship other things when you can worship the one who made everything and the one who's in control of everything. Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. You can go back there in your Bible to Galatians chapter 4. It says here, But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, that's very important, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Now, why did I say that's very important? Because we're going to see here as Paul goes on, he's actually saying to these people, you know, he's questioning if they're even saved. We'll see that. Galatians 4 9, though, what it said there, it's very important. Now, after that, ye have known God. And then he says, he clarifies it. In other words, there's a lot of people that claim that they know God. And how do you test whether or not that's real? Or rather, are known of God. You say, I know God. Yeah, but does God know you? You say, well, I, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. What makes you a Christian? You say, well, I'm saved. Who saved you? Did God save you or did you save yourself by your Faults. You know, there's a lot of people who profess to be Christians and they're not Christians. They're false converts. You see, salvation is up to God. It's not really up to us. And when we come to the Lord and we come and we're there and we're in a broken spirit and we're saying, you know, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm a wicked, rotten, filthy sinner. I can't do one thing at all to save myself. I am throwing myself at the foot of the cross and Please, the blood of Jesus Christ, please cleanse me from these sins. Please save me. See, it's up to God at that point in time to see, is this person sincere or not? There's a lot of people that pray prayers, and there's a lot of people that come forward and whatever else and make decisions, you know, and they're no more saved than, you know, anything. <laughs> they're not saved. Why? God didn't save them. Why? Their heart wasn't right. Their heart was not broken. 
they did not come in a repentant state. That's very important to get. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. You say, could you give me an example? We're going to read it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 23, or 21 to 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out, have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Notice it does not say, you never knew me. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, if I say to you, um, where do you work? You say, well, you know, I work in the kitchen, you know, just getting myself something to eat. No, you tell me what you do for a living, what you do most of your week. So when you have somebody who works iniquity, you have somebody who is basically living a life of sin, unrepentant sin. And you get a lot of people who profess to be Christians and they live a life of horrible, wicked, unrepentant sin without any concern at all for living right or cleaning up their lives. They're not grieved by their sin. They're not upset or anything about it. No desire to change. What are they? They're false converts. They're people that work iniquity and God will say to them one day I never knew you I never knew you and they'll say Lord Lord I I did all these great things I, I did you know I went to church and God's gonna say sorry you didn't make it I never knew you see salvation is up to God all right it's his decision who gets in and who does not that's why you come to him in a broken state God doesn't want a bunch of prideful little people down here saying, hey, you, you're going to save me because I'm telling you to save me. God's not going to fall for that. And until you come in a state where you are admitting to being a sinner and you've given up your self-righteous pride, you aren't going to get saved. Just as simple as that. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22 says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You see, there are people that have the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ there, according to verse 20. They have the knowledge, but it never makes it down to their heart. Their heart's never broken. Okay? They never come. They never come as a sinner before God. They never realize their true condition. God's not going to save somebody like that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 and 7 says, I have planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Who saves people? God does. You cannot save yourself. That's why you must come to God in a broken state. God will give the increase, not man. That's so important to understand that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. You see, you can fake, you can fake being a Christian. Okay, there have been people that have played in movies, actors and things like that, and they fake being a Christian. You know, this. I remember hearing this, uh, the Jesus film or whatever put out by Campus Crusade for Communists or whatever it is. You know, Bill Bright and his satanic organization there. This movie that they came out with, the guy who played Jesus was a Roman Catholic. Guy's not even saved. And he's playing Jesus? Sure. But anyhow, let's get back to Galatians chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. 
It says here, Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Okay? Now, Paul was not rebuking them for having a changed life. Okay, the thing about you observe days, months, times, years. He's not saying, hey, you guys have a changed life. I'm rebuking you. No. What he's rebuking they, these people for is they're trying to go back under the Old Testament law where a man is not justified by faith alone in the blood of Jesus Christ. No, he's justified by keeping the Sabbath day and by following these Old Testament Levitical laws and things. They're trying to go back to it. That's why Paul's rebuking them. Okay. But notice there in verse 11, he says, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. You see, if you go back up to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if, if you remember that, we read it earlier. He says, I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. See, all we can really do down here is we can say, well, you know, I witnessed to so-and-so, or I've preached to so-and-so, or whatever, gave him a tract, or whatever. You know, we're planting seeds. Somebody else comes along and says, yeah, you know, I have heard the Bible, but I just don't understand this, and I don't understand that, and whatever else. And so that Christian comes and waters the seed that was planted. They said, well, let me show you what the reason that that track says this, or this whatever says that. And they show them from the, the Word of God. They instruct them in the Word of God. But who is it that causes the salvation? God does. Okay? And you have a free will. You can come to the Lord and you have the will to, ac to accept or reject Jesus Christ. Sure, that's there. But the fact is, it's still up to God who gets in. That's very important to understand. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 12 through 16. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. In my temptation which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Um, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're in any kind of a ministry, that will happen to you eventually. People that said, oh, you're, oh, you're so blessed. I'm just so blessed to listen to you and the blessedness that they speak of there. You know, they will love you. Until you start to step on their toes. Until you start to say things that they don't like to hear. All of a sudden, then you, they become, you know, you become their enemy. You're a heretic. I get that thing all the time. People, you know, I used to listen to Brian Dellinger, but now he's a heretic because he teaches work salvation and because he teaches that you can lose your salvation and he teaches this and he teaches that. Yeah, whatever. You know, I mean, examine it. I don't teach work salvation. And secondly, I don't teach that you can lose your salvation. If you are genu genuinely saved, no, I don't believe that you can lose your salvation. You know, see, a real truly saved person is not going to mess around with what goes on in Reve or, uh, Romans chapter 11 and Revelation chapter 22. You know, you're not going to attack the Jews. You're not going to mess around with the word of God. It's, it's, those thoughts don't even enter into the mind of somebody who's genuinely saved. See, whatever. I've done videos on it. You can check that stuff out if you want to. Galatians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. It says here, They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you, that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. Okay? It's very interesting here. The Christians were, quote-unquote, zealously affected to go back under the law, and he said, but not well. In other words, these Jews that were coming to these Galatian believers, they were saying, you need to come back here under the Old Testament. And they were getting all zealous for it. They were observing times and days and years, and they were getting all you know zealous, learning all these Old Testament ways. And Paul said, you're zealous, but it's not well. It's not in the right way. Okay? It's not good. They were trying to, it says, they, yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. Again, the Jews are trying to exclude these Galatian believers from the rest of the body of Christ. They're saying, oh, don't, you don't want to just be a Christian. You've got to be a Jew. You've got to be like us. You've got to be 
speak Hebrew and know all the Jewish customs and ways and things like that. See, they were trying to exclude them. Why? That ye might affect them. In other words, make them feel better about themselves. That's what they were trying to do. And it's interesting, verse 18, he says, But it is good to be zealously affected in a, always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. In other words, these Galatian believers were being two-faced. They were being hypocritical with Paul. You know, when he was away from them, they were going, oh, let's, let's go back under the law. Let's go back and act like we're Old Testament Jews. And then when he would get there, they'd say, oh, no, I'm a Christian. I'm not trying to go back under the Old Testament. You know, well, we're, we're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh-huh. They're hypocrites. Okay. Very wicked there. Uh, verse 19, Galatians 4, 19 and 20, here it says, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Hmm. You know, you'll get around Christians that are like that. You're around them and there's, oh, God bless you, brother. And oh, yeah, the King James Bible. I, I believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word and I, I don't listen to the new CCM stuff. I only listen to the old hymns. And and da, 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 da. and then you hear reports of that same person. Oh, oh, excuse me. You'll hear reports of that same person promoting new versions, promoting modern music, having all kinds of problems. You say, well, wait a second here. When I'm with them, they're King James Bible believing. When I'm not with them, they're totally different. Is that person really saved? That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, you know, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice. Why? So that they wouldn't do the two-faced thing around him. And why was Paul thinking that? Because he says here, for I stand in doubt of you. And this movement of easy believism is going just running rampant throughout, you know, Bible-believing Christianity, this thing of don't ever preach repentance, don't, don't preach the new birth, don't preach, you know, a changed life after salvation, you know, and if somebody, if somebody could, if they say that they're saved, if they say that they have faith in Jesus Christ, then, then by God, you know, they are saved. They are just, they are there, they are Christian. You don't have to have any changed life. But yet you study through the Pauline epistles and it's like, uh, you you do have to have a changed life. You know, and, and what is the key philosophy behind all of this easy believism? What is it? Take an easier attitude towards sin. That's why they're saying you don't have to change your life. That's why I'm so radically against this whole movement. Yes, there does, does need to be a changed life. Yes, you do have to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. And these people that aren't, these people that are two-faced and hypocritical and they'll say what they believe changes you know when they're with different crowds of people you know you know what I think I stand in doubt of them I really do I stand in doubt of a lot of people you know and and you know again what's worse me just coming out and saying, hey, I think everybody's saved. If you're a Christian, you say you're a Christian, then you're saved. Everybody's saved. You just believe and you're saved. That's it. Or me saying, I'm worried about certain people and I want to try to witness to you and get you to examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Make sure that you are saved. See, you're not going to come away from this ministry right here. You're not going to come away from this ministry saying, Oh, I'm a Christian, you know, and I have all these problems and stuff like that. No, I want you to come away from this ministry examining yourself, examining your life and saying, am I really truly saved? Has God saved me? Am I really born again? I was a false convert for most of my life. It was only when I was 25 years old that I realized my little prayer that I prayed back as an eight-year-old boy in Sunday school, that little thing I did there, that wasn't it. I didn't make it in. God didn't save me at that point in time. Why? I wasn't broken. I didn't come to him in a repentant state. You know? 
I heard a nice little thing in Sunday school and I thought, oh, I want to be a Christian, so I'll pray the prayer, you know. And praying a prayer is part of salvation, you know. I believe that you're to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. But the point is there has to be a broken, a brokenness there, a repentant spirit that has to be there. And all these brethren that are backing off on that and, and saying, take an easier attitude towards sin. Don't preach against sin. Don't tell sinners that they need to come and repent and change their life when they get saved. That is, that is the epitome of Satanism. It is satanic, completely satanic to tell people there is no new birth. There is no change that happens as a result of your salvation. You say, well, it's all about you then. It's all about, no. See, let me just say this. I'm, I know I'm rabbit trailing again here, but let me just say this. People say salvation is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's faith in Jesus. And you know what? They're absolutely correct about that. But see, here's the point. When Jesus Christ saves you because he is God the Father, when he saves you, his Holy Spirit moves into your body and you change. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And when God saves you, he now says, I own you. And either you're going to straighten up your life or I'm going to chasten you. And so when you see somebody and they have chastening in their life because of their sin, good chance that they're saved. And when they know, I mean, I've met Christians that are in just total wicked sin, just totally living filthy, horrible things that they've done. And they hang their head and they're just like, I don't know why God just doesn't send me to hell. I just deserve to go to hell. I just, oh man, I'm trying so hard to get rid of this sin and I'm just trying and I'm struggling with it. And I, Please pray for me. That's a repentant spirit that comes from somebody who's genuinely saved. But when you see these people and they're like, I don't have a problem with it. What's the big deal, man? I mean, who are you to judge me? You know, okay, I use an NIV. Who cares? No, there's no such thing as a perfect Bible out there. Whatever. Yeah, I listen to rock music. Who are you to judge me? See what you're dealing with? You're dealing with somebody who's different there. You are dealing with a false convert. A very, very important distinction that you have to get. And it was going on back here in the first century, going on in the Bible. That's why Paul is saying there, he's saying, I stand in doubt of you. What does it mean? What does that mean to all you out there that believe in easy believism? When you stand in doubt of somebody, what does that mean? Oh, maybe they're not going to get as many rewards or something. Give me a break. He's standing in doubt of them saying, I don't think that you're saved. And notice up there in the verse before that, verse 19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Uh, if they had Christ, you know, if Christ has to be formed in them, then I would say that they're probably not saved yet. And you say, well, it's just talking about sanctification and things like that. Okay, but sanctification comes as a result of true salvation. See, it is all about Jesus. And when Jesus Christ saves you, things change. And we're going to see about that as we continue. Verse 21. Tell me, Ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Okay? And again, if you're truly saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, He's the mediator of the New Testament that came in, if you are truly saved, what on earth are you trying to do going back to the Old Testament system of animal sacrifice and all the Levitical laws, the laws and things there? And What are you trying to go back under that for if you're genuinely saved by Jesus Christ? Would a real, true saved person want to go back and live under the Old Testament laws? Doesn't make much sense. Let's look at verse 22 here. Galatians 4.22 For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is agar. Okay, let me just stop here for a second. These things are an allegory. 
you say, well, here it's talking about, you know, the fact that Ishmael was the father of the Arabic people, you know, and Abraham and Hagar produced Ishmael, and that's the Arabs, and they are not, you know, the same as the Jewish people that, you know, came from Sarah and Abraham, and they produced Isaac, you know, and, and, and you know, that's a different line. But, but see, that's not allegory. That's actually what happened. When you have an allegory, it's something saying, I'm going to tell you this story, and it's going to relate to this other thing over here. See? What's going on here in this passage? Let's continue. I'll show you. Verse 25. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Or children. Remember? From earlier, children of God. Hmm. What's going on here? We have two different types of salvation. Okay, true salvation and false, professing salvation. Number one, you have the false converts who believe God is their father, but they are merely fleshly, wicked, and haters of the truth. Romans chapter 6, verse 15 through 18 says, What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of of righteousness. You say, well then, Brian, you're saying you believe in sinless perfection. Not for one second. No. No, I don't believe in sinless perfection. I don't believe a Christian can get to a point where they don't sin anymore. No, I don't believe that. You know, I'm never taught that. But what this passage is saying is, when you get truly saved, something changes. You no longer, you are now free from sin. You now have the Holy Spirit within you and you are bought with a price. You now are God's property. So God says, hey, you, yeah, you, saved child of mine, don't touch that. Don't drink that. Don't look at that. And if you do, I'm going to punish you. Was that relationship there before? Before you were saved? No, no. What were you? You were a carnal fleshly, born after the flesh, just like Ishmael. See the allegory there, right? You were not part of the family. Was Ishmael really truly part of Abraham's promised seed? No. Why? Because it wasn't a Jew that was the mother. It was an Egyptian, a descendant of Ham, not a descendant of Shem. So God looks and he says, no, I don't recognize that. I'm not going to accept that child there as I'm not going to give him the kingdom. He's not part of that Abrahamic covenant. The Arabic people, you know, which are predominantly Muslim today, they do not have any inheritance at all with that child that came by promise. The descendants of, of Isaac there. Okay? So the descendants of Ishmael, unless they get saved and become Christians today, <laughs> they're not going to have anything to do with that millennial kingdom which is coming for the Jewish people. But you will if you are saved. What about the second type of a convert there? You have the truly saved, born again, new creatures in Christ Jesus. That's what you have there. That's what's going on in this passage. That's what the allegory is. The allegory is showing you real, genuine conversion versus false conversion. Galatians 4, verse 27 says, For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. That's a quotation from Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1. But uh, going on here, Galatians chapter 4, verse 28 and 29 now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Now again, 
you know, is there a physical application here? Do the Arabic people, the Muslim people, persecute the descendants there of Isaac? Yeah, they do. They really do. Of course, that's true. But remember, this passage is speaking allegorically. So, what's the allegory there? You have false converts persecuting the truly saved. Does that happen? Oh, yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. In journeyings, often perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. And I like to ask these easy believism people, could you please tell me who the false brethren are? If salvation is just simply belief in Jesus Christ, how could you have a false brother? It doesn't make any sense. See, the new, modern, you know, professing Christian, they will persecute you as a King James Bible believer. They'll call you cultic. They'll call you backward and bigoted and whatever else. They'll persecute you. Yeah. Look at the comments on these videos. Reply to some of the comments on the videos. You'll get persecuted. It's amazing. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 says... But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. What do we read there? As then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now, you see, when you have a false convert, the reason that they are a false convert is because they don't want to give up on their flesh. They are run and controlled by their flesh. They're not led of the Spirit. That's why they have a hard time accepting truth and things like that, because it's not the Holy Spirit. You know, we're taught in the Bible that the Holy Spirit, when He comes into somebody, He leads them into all truth. He guides them into all truth. So you have somebody there. And, you know, yes, I understand you can resist the Holy Spirit. Yes, I can understand, you know, you can grieve the Spirit. You can resist the truth. I understand that. But then there's chastening. See? But when you see people that are just prospering and just everything's just going wonderful and everything else, and they hate the truth, they can't stand it, you are dealing with false brethren. And you will see, if you try to talk to them about the truth, they will persecute you. They will come after you. They will attack you. It's right there. Galatians chapter 4, verse 30 and 31. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. When is the casting out going to happen? At the rapture. You see, right now you can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Who is saved? Who is lost? Well, I believe he's saved. Well, I believe he's lost. You can do all that talking. But the fact of the matter is, there's going to come a point in time when the bondwoman and her son are cast out. And all these false professing people that said that they're Christians and they're not Christians, they're not truly born again, they've never been chosen by God for salvation. And again, I'm not talking about Calvinism, okay? I'm not saying that you were predetermined before the foundation of the world, pre-elected, and you had no choice in the matter, and God saves you whether you want to or not. That's nonsense, okay? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you come to God by an act of your own free will, but you come in a broken state and you say, God, please save me. And he looks and he examines your heart and he says, this one's for real. That one there, yeah, I'll save that one. When you do that, when you come in that state and God saves you, he now owns you and he will tell you what to do with your life. And if you resist, he will punish you. That's the way it is. And 
when we will see this, the full manifestation of this thing is going to be at the rapture. And if you're watching this video, uh, we're still here. The body of Christ is not left yet, which that means that it's not God's time yet. Okay, God still has people that need to get saved. God still has his prophetic timetable. He has it all laid out. You know, I, I firmly believe that. I don't believe it's like, you know, kind of a mysterious thing of, oh, I, hey, I think today. You know, no, I think God has everything all laid out. He has it all planned out. All right. But there are still some people that need to be saved yet. And that's why I'm always telling brethren, you know, do as much witnessing as you can, do as much attracting as you can. But the fact of the matter is, this movement is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And I'm seeing more and more brethren falling for this easy believism thing, and they're telling sinners, you don't need to repent. Don't preach to sinners that they are sinners. You know, that, I mean, trick them into salvation, then that comes later on. Um, if you come to the God and not and you're not in a broken state, if you don't come to God as a sinner, you're not going to be saved. Okay, Jesus Christ came to call sinners to repentance. All right? When you get saved, when God saves you, okay? That's what I mean when you when I say when you get saved, you need to get saved. Who does the saving? God does. And when that happens, he will control your life. One way or the other. Okay? If you sin, he'll beat you the whole way till finally he says, okay, that's enough of that and pulls you out of here. He'll kill you. All right? I've seen that happen. I've seen Christians die prematurely because they were messing around in sin. All right? But when you see somebody that there's really not that chastening there and they hate the truth, they won't use the King James Bible, they won't, you know, listen to the right kind of music, they, you know, on and on and on, you know, and again, I know that a lot of Christians are falling for false doctrine right now and it's very, very blurry, very hazy right now. I know that. But there are just... I, I can't preach this thing enough, brethren. We need to be very, very careful who we're saying is saved and who, you know, we're, oh, I think that they're saved, but, you know, they yeah, they have a whole bunch of problems. I fear more than anything else telling somebody that they're saved when they're lost and one day having to stand there at the great white throne judgment and look down and see that person that I told them that they were saved. I fear that greatly. I don't want to have somebody's blood on my hands because I told them that they're saved when in reality they were lost. It's a very serious thing. So that will be it for Galatians chapter 4. Let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you so much, Lord, that we can know that we are saved uh, your word tells us that we can in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. And Lord, we do have the standard of your holy word, and, and we can see and, and try the spirits and test the spirits of people and say, you know, are you really saved? And, and look at how they respond to the word of God. And uh, Lord, I, just, I pray, Lord, that uh, people out there would not fall for this Hebrew roots thing or whatever else of people trying to take them back under the law again. But uh, they would just stand by your word and, and, and witness for you. And uh, I pray, Lord, for the Christians out there because I know things are getting really, really crazy and really wild out there. I pray that they would keep it in the back of their minds that they are children of yours and that they are joint heirs. And uh, someday we're going to get this world back. And it's going to be in holiness and righteousness at that point in time. It's not going to be this wicked, corrupt world. And uh, I know it's so vexing to be a Christian living today. It's, it's just horrible going out in the world and seeing things the way that they're going. But I just pray, Lord, that, that those of you, those saints out there that are watching uh, the, this video right now, that they would keep it in mind that, that uh, it will be worth it all when we see you face to face. And we'll understand everything then, too. And I just... Uh, ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Okay, <laughs> that's going to be it for Galatians chapter 4. Um, we're going to continue this study next week in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, it's a really interesting book here. And, you know, I just want to say one other thing here, and that is I'm not against studying Hebrew, the Hebrew alphabet or certain things about Jewish culture, Jewish traditions, things like that. I'm not, I'm not trying to rip on the Jews or people that are, you know, they're, you know, the whole system there, the Israeli thing, whatever. I'm not at all against that. In fact, I'm very much for that. Um, but what you got to watch out for is when you have people that are trying to take you back under the Old Testament law. And they're trying to say that you're not justified by faith in Jesus Christ anymore. You have to go back and you have to do this and do this and do that and do this and do that. You know, and, and that's not what I teach, by the way, for the people out there that keep lying about me and saying that I'm teaching work salvation. I am not teaching work salvation, okay? I am teaching broken. Did you come to God broken? And He'll fix you. But then He owns you. And see, it, it's kind of interesting because if, you know, like I've said in many other studies, if salvation is just merely belief without changed life, why doesn't everybody believe? The lost world knows better. They know what it means to be saved. That's why they resist it. They know it means a changed life. And that's what salvation really is. And, you know, I just, boy, I really, really have a burden about this thing. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. You know, I listened to a, a sermon by Lester Roloff and uh, was preaching back in the 1970s or something, I think. And he was talking about the thing of repentance. And he said about, he told a story, he said, you know, it'd be like if I was at a motel and some guy came and took my wallet while I was sleeping. And then the next day he confessed to me that he had taken my wallet, but he didn't give me my wallet back. I'd say, well, then you're not really sorry. See, it's the same thing. Somebody comes to God, and they say, please forgive me for my sins. And the Lord says, are you sorry for your sins? Not really. And I'm going to keep doing them, but I want you to forgive me. Huh? Uh, that doesn't work. Salvation is a changed life. And what's happening uh, tragically, so very tragically, you have so many people that are coming to God, praying prayers, thinking, I'm getting in with this prayer. I'm a Christian now because I believe in Jesus. And God looks at their heart. He tries their heart and He says, You're not right. Your heart's not right before me. I'm sorry, I can't save you. I will not purchase you with the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross. You still have too much self-righteousness about you. How sad, how tragic. Don't fall for this false gospel. You say, uh, is, it, is it really that bad, Brian? I mean, is it really getting that bad? It is that bad. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to be doing a video on this in the future. The falling away that you read about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There shall come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. You know, that falling away, you know, apostasy, that horrible thing that's happening, the culmination of it, I believe, is the easy believism gospel. The gospel of salvation without any changed life. You know, God the Father purchases you, and His Holy Spirit moves into your life and into your body, but nothing changes. That is the most satanic thing that you can do outside of changing the King James Bible with these new versions. The new versions are of the same mindset, so to speak, along with this easy believism thing. We can change what God made. We can change God's ways. We can change, God lo change God's laws. And you can be right with God using a corrupt satanic Bible perversion. It's the same thing as this modern, easy believism gospel. You can be right with God without any changed life. Reject truth all you want, doesn't matter. You are saved simply because you believe. You know? I just, it is so tragic. You are saved because you believe. But it's because you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross because you can't save yourself. Because you are broken as a sinner. And you are saying, I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what I have to do. I don't care what I have to give up. I need to be saved. I have to be saved. God, please save me. 
That's salvation. That is true belief. But you can't take belief only and remove repentance from the equation and remove a changed life after salvation. You can't remove those things and expect it to stay the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't do that. And like I said, I'm going to be bringing out some more information on this in the future, how this falling away has happened. And, and uh, I'm just going to tell you right up front, um, there have been some things I've been defending, and I'm not going to defend them anymore. Some men in the past that I once considered great soldiers of the faith, I don't consider them that way anymore. These men had a, had a hand in bringing about the falling away. Back in the 1800s, some of the great heroes of the faith uh, you start looking into their lives and you start to realize they had some satanic connections. And it was through them that the falling away happened. I'm going to show you some of that in the future in a video that I'm going to be making. But until then, we will be back next week with Galatians chapter 5 and then Galatians chapter 6 the week after that. So um, please tune in for those studies. And if you have any comments, things that I didn't uh, cover well or whatever else, you know, uh, leave them down in the comment section. I, I do look at the comments, you know. I, I mean, I can't look at all. I mean, I have over 500 videos now. I can't look at all the comments of every single video every day that it's updated or whatever else. But I do I do try to keep track of, of you know, at least the first week or two of when I put out a video. You know, I'll try to look at the comments. And I really do appreciate the kind words. I do appreciate sometimes the challenges, too. That people say, "Hey Brian, you missed this, or you messed up on that, or whatever." I appreciate that stuff. I'm not, I'm not totally closed-minded to criticism. You know, I appreciate it. You know, if you're putting links to to false websites and things, well, you'll be removed. If you can't control your your mouth and you're getting filthy, well, you'll be removed. Um, if you're being unnecessarily rude to me, you know, and not constructively, you know, exhorting me as a brother. Yeah, you're going to be removed. You know, I'm, I'm not going to put up with that stuff. So, I think that's about it. I think I covered everything. So, uh, we will see you next week in Galatians chapter 5. Thank you for watching.